Good morning. So, as I mentioned to you last week, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is lesson eight. And oddly, we're going to be in this section now of chapter 15 for several weeks uh, on purpose because I feel the need in the midst of our crazy times to have a discussion on the rapture of the church, which is losing popularity. People are disagreeing with the whole concept of a pre-tribulation rapture. And so I'm going to spend a bunch of time talking to you about the rapture. But in order to do that, I'm going to be giving you lessons on dispensationalism and Israel and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, I had decided to do two points today. Uh, and I thought about the time I got through point number one, building PowerPoint slides, that I might be biting off more than I can chew. I realized after preparing one point in the first service today, I still bit off more than I could chew, which is typical. The first service is the guinea pig service. You guys know that. <laughs> and so <clears throat> we're going to go kind of quickly. And so I have a PowerPoint Uh, I'm focusing really on one verse in particular. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised up and caught up together with the Lord in the air. We shall forever be with the Lord. And so um, just to lighten the mood, because it's going to be a fast and uh, theological ride, Uh, I thought I would put in something for your amusement. Your dogs do not go to heaven. I'm sorry. I know people are very frustrated about that. Uh, But um, hey, who knows what God will do in the new heaven, the new earth, and uh, all the the stuff that I have, you know, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us all the details. But at the rapture, only the born again, living saints will be raptured and the church age that have passed on will be raptured at before the tribulation period, which we'll talk about today. But first of all, I want to give you a preview of what we're going to be doing the next several weeks. I would encourage you as best you can to be here each week or watch online. Uh, for those of you that still watch online and or if you come into the building and can't get in, still watch online because these things will line upon line and precept upon precept be Important. So the first, today, we'll be talking about dispensational theology and why it's important to biblical understanding. I realize that this will be a review for a lot of you, but we have a a number of new members, and I think this is important about once or twice a year to kind of hit and make sure that you understand it. Secondly, we'll be next Sunday talking about the church as distinct from Israel and the redeemed from other dispensations. Then we'll be talking about the purpose of the tribulation. There is a specific purpose for the tribulation which relates to why the rapture. And so what is the rapture? We'll talk about that. The purpose of the rapture, the timing of the rapture, the second coming of Jesus as distinct from the rapture. The rapture happens, then the seven-year tribulation, and then the second coming. And then the millennial kingdom, a literal physical reign of Christ. It's a literal thousand years. The Bible makes that very clear, even though many people today argue that this is not the case. And then my favorite, and the whatever otherwise I want to share section, (laughs) which I told you about last week. So again, for those of you that have been members of Candlelight for any length of time, you probably already have one of our bookmarks. Uh, You should have one. If you don't have one, they're available in the lobby. Uh, We're ordering those all the time, and we want you to understand dispensational theology and read your Bible through a dispensational lens. Now, let me offend those of you that might be covenantal. If you do not have a solid biblical dispensational model, you do have false doctrine. I can guarantee it. And I will explain that along the way, but... People that don't understand biblical dispensationalism have a muddy gospel. They have a very hard time distinguishing between the the church and the rest of the redeemed from all dispensations, saints and saints and saints. 
because there's distinctions between Old Testament saints, church age saints, and tribulation saints. And if you don't understand that, everything gets muddy. And so we need to talk about that. Dispensational theology is a study of scripture through a lens. And the lens has everything to do with the administration that God has employed during different periods of time. And so every dispensation is unique, the way God is interacting with men. Every dispensation has a command, a failure, and a consequence. Now, in this model, I have the yellow full circle. That is not technically a dispensation. Because a dispensation then, scientifically, in the hermeneutics, needs to have a command, failure, and consequence. But the new heaven and the new earth has no failure and therefore no consequence. So it doesn't fit in the study of dispensationalism the way it is classically understood. But it is an administration. It is a period going forward after the great white throne judgment. And so I want to talk about that because the Bible talks about that. So we'll look at this. So the first dispensation is the dispensation of innocence. This is from the creation. We believe that God created the entirety of all that exists in the material world in six literal days, uh, as is described in Genesis. Many liberal theologians today believe in gap theories. They believe in, uh, you know, kind of a combination of theistic evolution. You know, God said bang, and then everything started taking place. No. He created the entirety in six literal days. We believe that because Moses is the one that d documented all of this for us in Genesis many years later. And he used the, the specific language of a literal day when he was documenting it. And by the time he was documenting this, it would have been natural to understand evening and morning is the day one or first day, second day, third day, depending on the way you like to examine the Hebrew. Day one and then... Uh, day two and so forth. So literal six day creation. On the sixth day, God created man and he put them in the garden and he gave them a command. Uh, subdue everything, have fun and uh, don't eat that tree. And so <clears throat> they disobeyed. And because they ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they immediately became self-aware. That is very important. They had revival of conscience. They decided, oh, we're naked. See, and before that, they didn't notice that they were naked because they weren't self-consumed. And of course, as you know, the problem of self is a continuing problem to this very day. Uh, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and follow me. And so self-awareness, self-consciousness came to life and they decided, well, we're going to clothe ourselves with fig leaves and not in a comfortable form of attire. And God said, insufficient. He created an animal sacrifice and he then required animal sacrifice going forward, even through uh, the time of Moses and into the millennial kingdom, which we'll see uh, is a uh, force or a kind of a looking back to the cross, which we'll discuss a little bit more later. So the command was don't eat the tree. They failed. Then we had what we call the curse that was introduced into the world. I want to teach you a phrase. Divine worldwide judgment. Think those three things, those three words. Divine worldwide judgment. So there's all kinds of judgments in the world. For example, when God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a localized judgment. It was a divine judgment, but it was not worldwide. And so every dispensation has a doorway through which it must pass into the next dispensation. And the doorway is a divine worldwide judgment. And so in this context, the curse becomes the first divine worldwide judgment. And in this case, as you know, it was the curse and there was a lot related to it. And for the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving along rather than the take the time I explained a little bit more of this uh, in the first service. So we'll keep moving. So then we have what is called the administration or dispensation of conscience. Uh, the animal sacrifices were enacted. Uh, men were called to do good. Uh, to obey the Lord, and they disobeyed. And in the processes of their disobedience, which lasted about 1,600 years, 
Finally, mankind had become so wicked that God was grieved that he made man. King James says it repenteth him that he made man. Uh, That's kind of clunky for us because when we think of repentance, we think of the changing of mind. Uh, God doesn't change his mind. Uh, God is omniscient. He knows all things from before time. Uh, He knows the end from the beginning. He declares the end from the beginning. And so in communicating with men and women, oftentimes he will use language that makes it appear as though he's changing his mind, but it's purposeful in his interchange with men. So 1,600 years goes by. Mankind is filled with violence, and God is grieved that he made man, and so he introduces the second divine worldwide judgment, the global flood. It was not a localized flood. It was a global flood. And so he begins again in the dispensation of human government with eight people. Eight in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. And so it was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. And God started over with Noah and his family, eight people in all. In the process, God gave the command that they should scatter over the face of the earth and that they should procreate and and repopulate the earth. But they, under the leadership of Nimrod, disobeyed the Lord and they clustered together in the area of Ur of the Chaldees or in what we would think of today as modern day Babylon in Iraq And they built a tower to make a name for themselves. There's self again. And the Lord saw what mankind was doing in their disobedience. And he did not want man unified. I digress for just a minute. The spirit of Babylon is in the world today. And it manifests in the, I'll give you two things very quickly. Globalism and no borders. And so when you're thinking about globalism and when you're thinking about no no borders, think about the spirit of Babylon. And we know in the book of Revelation that Babylon the Great will fall. And there, of course, is mystery Babylon, political Babylon, and the literal city of Babylon. All three are going to have their demise in the future. Uh, But man is still in rebellion against God. But I digress. Now, what did God do? He created then, in this case, for the benefit of his purposes and for man. A confusion of tongues and the disbursement of people into various nations and the boundaries of their dwelling places. The Bible makes it very clear that God does not want us to be looking forward to globalism under human governance. There is a day coming when Jesus will have his theocratic kingdom and there will be a global rule. But that is when Jesus reigns, not people. And the Antichrist is the guy that will come onto the scene that will ultimately come in the place of Christ, anti-Christ, in the place of Christ, to try to create this utopian globalism that the World Economic Forum and all of this liberalism is infecting in our world today. Uh, It will fall, as mentioned. So God separated the people groups and he separated their languages and he spread them out over the earth. And this is the third divine worldwide judgment. And so, once again, I must mention to you that even in an economic system, it is better for the world not to be global. Because if there's a failure, if globalism fails, everything fails. If there's uh, localized governance, one can fail and the other can be strong and they can interchange and help one another. And this, of course, uh, fulfills indeed the purposes of God. The fourth dispensation is the dispensation of the Old Covenant. Some dispensational models have two dispensations here, the promise and law. Uh, I like to include them as one because the sign of the covenant was circumcision. It started with Abraham and the law was introduced because of transgressions. We learn this from Paul in the book of Galatians. And so it was after the globalism was stopped and the confusion of tongues that God separated the people into different people groups and he then, in his sovereignty, chose one man and had a covenant with that man and told that man, I'm going to make of you a great nation. One of many nations, but of the nations, he made one in particular, a people group that he would make himself known, learn this, to that he might make himself known through. 
So God made himself known to Abraham and his descendants, Isaac and his descendants, Jacob and the the sons of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. The the tribes became uh, named after the sons of Israel. And God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you and with the land of Israel. We'll talk a lot about this. And that in this group of people, he would make himself known to them so that he would make himself known through them. Very important to your biblical understanding. God cared about the rest of the world, even under the old covenant dispensation, when many people think, oh, well, God only cared about Israel at that time. No, that's not true. He made himself known to Israel that he might make himself known through Israel for the benefit of the whole world. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob is in the land with the, uh, the people, the, the number of individuals that were the tribes uh, in their earliest development, they were in Canaan. Uh, God had told them to go into Canaan and to, to disperse all the people because of their practice of child sacrifice. And in the processes of time, there was problems in Canaan and they went to Egypt. In Egypt for a number of years, they developed and grew until a new Pharaoh came when you are familiar with the Exodus. Plagues were developed. God delivered his people through the Red Sea back to the wilderness. And then from Mount Nebo, looking across the Kidron Valley, looked at Israel and said, you're going in. Moses, you stay here. But uh, Joshua, take the people and go and conquer the land. And then, of course, you understand Uh, Most of you probably at least some of the history of the conquering the land in Joshua and the times that developed until the kings and ultimately uh, the coming of the king, Jesus, the Messiah. And so during the process of the old covenant, there was a requirement for sacrifice and then the introduction of the law and the keeping of the law. And no one could keep the law. They were disobedient to the law. Their hearts were far from the Lord. Uh, there was, it was impossible. And that was indeed the purpose of the law, to bring people to their knees, to cause people to recognize that they can't save themselves by being good. This is summarized in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And the conclusion of that sermon was you shall be perfect and no one could be perfect. And that would take you back to the very first expression, blessed are the poor in spirit. And so once you get to the point where you know you need a savior, you understand the purpose of the law because the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Once again, Galatians, I'm giving you an entire Bible in 30 minutes. And so then you have the fourth divine worldwide judgment, divine worldwide judgment. This is argued. People say, no, the cross was a judgment on Jesus. Yes, it was. But Jesus died for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And so Jesus took our sin in his own body on the tree. We talked about the blood of Jesus last week. You can go back and look at all of that. And so Jesus laid his life down for the sins of the whole world. He suffered the wrath of God in our place for our sin. It was a divine worldwide judgment. We are in the church age. So the next dispensation in this timeline is the church age. This is where we live today. It is often called the dispensation of grace because indeed God is gracious to all of mankind as well as to Israel, giving us opportunity to hear the gospel of grace by faith alone, responding to that gospel and being saved. So not of works, lest any man should boast, the dispensation of grace. But God has been gracious in every dispensation from the very beginning. And so I prefer to call this the church age rather than the dispensation of grace. Now, the command in the church age is interesting because Jesus really gave two ultimate commands. Number one, go and preach the gospel to every creature. And so we go and we preach the good news of the saving grace of God by faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from the deeds of the law. And to keep sound doctrine. This is interesting because the majority of the New Testament epistles deal with sound doctrine and false doctrine and identifying false doctrine. 
The failure in the church age is the failure to proclaim the gospel and the failure to maintain good doctrine. And do I need to tell you that the majority of the churches in America today and around the world are not interested in doctrine? So God is going to judge the disobedient and he is going to judge those that reject the gospel and judge those that are proclaiming a false gospel. Paul the Apostle made very clear when he told the Galatians, if anyone preaches any other gospel than the one you have received, let him be accursed. And so the command is to preach the gospel, obviously in obedience to the Lord, and to maintain sound doctrine, something that is very unpopular in churching today. Many churches actually confess we don't teach doctrine. We just preach the gospel. That is an utter failure and it is a rebellious disobedience to the Lord. We must contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. So the rapture takes place at the end of the church age and it is indeed a time of judgment. I'll explain this, but what I want you to know about the rapture is that it is a divine worldwide judgment. Now, you, I know what you're thinking. It's the blessed hope of every believer. And you're right. The, for the believer, it is because we have come to Jesus at the cross. Right there. And if you've gone to Jesus at the cross, there is no future condemnatory judgment for the believer. Yeah. <laughs> Was that you, John? Who said that? Oh, praise the Lord. He had coffee this morning, Meister. So, look, if you've come to Jesus, there is no future contaminatory judgment, only blessing. And so for the believer, the rapture is the blessed hope but for all those that are left behind, it is a divine worldwide judgment. A lot to explain here, and we're going to get into the forensics as we work our way through. The tribulation follows the rapture, and as I mentioned to you before, the tribulation is a judgment. I'll come back to that. The second coming of Jesus is after the seven-year tribulation. Then we have the literal millennial reign of Christ. I'm moving too quickly. During the tribulation, the command is repent. And they will curse God and gnaw their tongues for pain, the Bible says. Until finally, at the end of the tribulation, God will bring Israel to their knees. Part of the purpose of the tribulation is to bring Israel to their knees. We'll develop that in the next couple of weeks. And then the great white throne judgment. This would be indeed the final, the seven in all, divine worldwide judgments. I challenge you to find any more than seven divine worldwide judgments in the Bible. There are none. There are definitively seven. Seven is the number of completeness. And the seventh divine worldwide judgment that in this case only relates to unbelievers is the great white throne judgment. All the dead will appear before the Lord and all whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet by that time are. And then, of course, there is going to be the new heaven and the new earth, uh, wherein righteousness dwells. And so technically, classically, not a dispensation, uh, but indeed a period of administration where we will be living with the Lord forever and ever. Now, the millennium is a literal period of time. It's a thousand years long. The church age at this period has been about 2,000 years. The tribulation is seven years. Uh, some of these others have transitional periods and historical dating that we can actually look to. So from the creation to the flood, 1,600 years, and, and from that period until Christ, uh, about 2,400 years. Of course, we understand that now. It's easy to look back at history, right? So the church is not going to be here during the tribulation. And I will document this a little more as we work this out. The tribulation is a dispensation of judgment on Israel and the Christ-rejecting population of the church age. 
We are those who are believers in Christ and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I'm quoting to you from our text. But everyone left behind is going to go into that period of time known as the tribulation, which is the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel said that there has never been a time like it, neither shall there be after it. Jesus said there's never been a time like it, neither shall there be after it. Thus, alone making it a dispensation of its own. If Jesus and Daniel both said there's never been a time like it, then we have some bookmarks that we can be looking at. And so the rapture of the church happens because you will not come under judgment There is no judgment for the church. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this indeed is the period of God's wrath being poured out on the inhabitants of the earth. And if you're still wrestling with this, and I'm going to document this a hundred ways to Friday, I guess, is the expression uh, before we get done with it. I want you to understand that the pre-tribulation rapture is not just an eschatological Issue That is a timeline and end of times or last things study. It is also a soteriological study. And so the salvation that has been provided to us. Soteriology is the study of our salvation. And if you have gone to the cross, there is no future condemnatory judgment for the believer. And that is indeed the blessed hope. And we are looking for the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we'll document for you pre-trib rapture, pre-trib rapture, a number of ways. Uh, And so I'll explain as we go. I want to give you a couple of things to consider in relationship to poor dispensational theology. If a person does not have good dispensational theology, they do have bad doctrine. Now, I'm going to mention this. Uh, I love my covenantal friends. I have many people that come from a very different biblical worldview, so to speak, using the term uh, mildly. Uh, So from study of scripture, they have come up with what they call covenant theology. Uh, Basically, there is the covenant of works and then there's the covenant of grace. Uh, God commanded people don't eat of the fruit. They ate of the fruit. And then from that period forward, God has dealt with men according to grace. In that context, they are correct. There's many things that we agree with covenantalists about. But when it comes to the forensics of the various economies and differences in which God is working with men, we see things very, very differently. A covenantalist will read the Old Testament and the New Testament kind of in harmony and often muddy up the gospel by integrating Old Testament teaching and New Testament teaching. Let me give you a couple of examples here. First and foremost, uh, in this case, the difference between saints, saints and saints. If you read your Bible like a covenantalist, saints are always redeemed people. But they're dealt with very differently. Uh, In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 21, we learn the horn. This is the Antichrist. Again, for the sake of time, we would have to do an exhaustive study just here. The horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. And so who is he talking about? Well, first of all, Daniel is writing to the nation and people of Israel, properly Judah, because they'd gone to Babylon. But this now through Ezekiel and Daniel, they are communicating the message to Judah and Israel or Israel, the whole of Israel. And he's giving them a view of the future. And in the future, there is going to be a time when the Antichrist rises to power. And when he rises to power, he is going to trample the saints. And so the saints that are being referred to there are the tribulation saints, the the believers and the Jews that are alive during the tribulation. And so the horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. He's looking into the future and explaining what he saw. Now, Jesus, at the end of the Old Covenant dispensation, said that he would build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
And so if the Antichrist is going to prevail against the saints, and Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the saints, then we've got a problem of saints, saints, and saints, or we think there's a contradiction in the Bible, and there's not. The Bible is absolutely filled with information and none with contradiction. And so we have to understand this through the lens of dispensational theology. Because the Old Testament saints were being addressed by Daniel about the tribulation saints that have not yet come to uh, existence at the time of the writing. And they have to be distinguished from the church age saints. The Antichrist, the devil, the enemy, whatever, will not prevail against the church. And so the church age saints, and you are referred to in Romans as saints, will have victory in the Lord. And there will be no prevailing against you by the gates of hell. Secondly, failure to distinguish Israel from the church. This is the fundamental difference between a covenantalist and a dispensationalist. Distinguishing Israel and the church. Uh, I want to just give you a couple of examples. The law was given to the Jews, only to the Jews. Never to the Gentiles. That If you don't understand that, if you don't take anything home today, take home that the law was never given to the Gentiles. It was a specific co covenant with Israel. And in this covenant, one of the rules, there are many, was that if you get healed, you're supposed to show yourself to a priest. And there was a reason for this. If you had a healing, and in this case, Jesus heals a gentleman and then says, go show yourself to a priest. This was at the latter years of the old covenant dispensation. It's before the cross. And he is to go show himself to a priest according to the law. And the reason that he would do this according to the law was that they knew that in prophecy, when the Messiah comes, he would heal the sick, the lame would walk, the blind would see, demons would be cast out, and all these miracles would be taking place, which is one of the reasons that we put, put a lot of emphasis on the miracles of Jesus in fundamental Bible doctrine. And in this context, he says, go show yourself to a priest. Why? And he kept telling people to do this because then these priests would be hearing, this guy was healed, this guy had a demon cast out, this guy wasn't able to walk, this guy had no eyes. And they would recognize the Messiah must be here. But they missed it altogether. But it was according to the law. I ask you, in the church age today, if you get a healing from the Lord, do you have to go show yourself to a priest? You see what I'm saying? So if you don't understand the distinction between the old covenant and the church age, you're going to have muddy doctrine. You're going to say, well, I guess we're supposed to show ourselves to a priest. Let's go find a Catholic. You know? <laughs> Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is having a dialogue with the rich young ruler and he says, if you want to enter into eternal life, keep all the commandments. Well, look, keeping the commandments didn't save anybody. In fact, nobody could keep all the commandments. And in his arrogance, he says, well, I've done that for my youth. And Jesus said, well, then go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And he went away with his head hanging low, which is exactly what the Lord wanted. He wanted him to be poor in spirit. He wanted him to say, I can't do it. I can't do it. And that's the point. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Paul writes to the Galatians. And then when you have come to Christ, you are no longer under a schoolmaster. And the law has been abolished in Christ. Colossians, Ephesians, Romans. This is all over the New Testament. And many people don't know that. Confusion between the second coming and the rapture. This is very easily uh, misunderstood because if you don't know who saints, saints and saints are, and if you are reading passages that relate to the fact that Jesus is coming again to rescue the saints, these are Israel, then you're going to think, well, of course, that's at the second coming. Uh, but indeed, there is a distinction between Old Testament saints, church age saints and tribulation saints. We who are alive and remain at the time of the rapture will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture. And then behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all and to convince all of their who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things and un, which ungodly sinners have spoken against the Lord. And so that's the second coming. 
And so you have to distinguish between the rapture and the second coming. And if you don't have a good dispensational model, it all gets muddy. Finally, I just want to talk about the muddy gospel, law and grace integrated. Uh, the Bible says, Paul writing to the Romans, you're not under law, but under grace. To the Galatians, he said, do I set aside the grace of God? For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And Jesus didn't die in vain, and you're not made righteous by the law. But today, the muddy gospel is, well, if you are a Christian, you have to keep the Sabbath. Or if you are a Christian, you have to tithe a full 10% or else. Or if you are a Christian, you can't eat pork or shellfish. God forbid, no sushi, right? Uh, I mean, look, you guys, you're not under the law. You never were, actually. Now, we still observe a Sabbath time. We like to rest, and we, are, we should rest. Everybody should have a Sabbath of some sort. But indeed, Sabbath was made for the man, not man for the Sabbath. And again, it was a, to benefit us. And it was a foreshadowing of things to come. The law was a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And so we understand something about the gospel. And this is a quote I wrote years ago. I'm going to just give it to you now. Any human effort designed to attain or maintain righteousness is an assault to the sufficiency of the cross. You should memorize that. Now, what that means is if you are, think you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but you have to keep the Sabbath or not eat a pork sandwich, then that's a human effort. And any human effort designed to attain or maintain righteousness is an assault to the sufficiency of the cross. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and he has washed it white as snow. Amen? Amen. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a noonday. He tells the Colossians, uh, uh, the uh, new moon, uh, these festivals, the, the pork sandwich, the, the crab you know, buffet, wherever it is. Don't be judged by this. Or new moons or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. I'm only using this to illustrate that those groups that want to integrate the old covenant laws and bring them into the church age are muddying up the gospel. It's a false gospel. And in the church age, we are commanded by God to maintain sound doctrine. And we're failing. And the judgment that is coming upon the whole world and those that reject the true gospel is going going to be the tribulation but not you because you've come to the cross and when you've come to the cross there is no future condemnatory judgment for you Jesus is our Sabbath we enter into his rest amen amen all right you you applauded the Lord let us stand and pray father thank you for this time a lot to process Help us to understand these things as we develop them over the weeks to come. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a beautiful afternoon.